Welcome everyone and happy Wear Red Canada Day. So exciting. Everyone's wearing red today and it's a, it's an amazing, amazing day all around Canada. Um, my name is Lisa Comber and I'm the manager of the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance and the Knowledge Translation Manager of the Canadian Women's Heart Health Centre here at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. We're excited today to present her hashtag Her Heart Matters, the assessment of women presenting in the emergency department with chest pain. I'm also privileged to have join us today, Nicole Nickerson, who is a person with lived experience with cardiovascular disease. She's also a patient advocate co-chair for our advocacy theme within the, within the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance and is uh, located in the middle of Nova Scotia. Uh, Dr. Shaheen Jaffer is a clinical professor of medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver and an internal medicine consultant and lives in Surrey, BC. And lastly, uh, Dr. Verinder Randhawa is a clinical and research fellow with the Critical Care and Health Failure Transplant Cardiology Unit at the University of Toronto and Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre and is located in Toronto, Ontario. Thank you everyone for joining us today on this very important topic. A few housekeeping uh, notes to mention. Next slide, please. If you're having any technical difficulties or have a question at any point during the webinar, please feel free to type it in the Q&A section at any time. Uh, there will be a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. And now, and due to the nature of this public platform, we ask that you keep your questions general in nature. And if you have more of a personal question, we recommend you contact your healthcare provider. Uh, to ensure that your sound is working properly, uh, please check your audio settings by clicking test speaker and microphone in your Zoom menu bar. Uh, there will be polling questions, at the, uh, one polling question at the beginning of the webinar, and you can answer this poll uh, anytime if you want. It's optional and it's anonymous. And lastly, uh, this session uh, is being recorded and will be available uh, on our website later this week. Next slide, please. We'd like to begin this national webinar by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. Uh, while this meeting today is on a virtual platform, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are visitors on this land and the importance of the lands which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and our responsibility to improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. Next slide, please. We have no disclosures to declare for this presentation. I'd like to just highlight our learning objectives or key takeaways for this, for this webinar. Uh, we will be describing the inequities, knowledge, and treatment gaps that exist uh, for heart disease in women. Uh, improve the awareness of unique risk factors, symptoms, and pathophysiology of women's heart health. Uh, share the perspectives of uh, women's experience, uh, Nicole, uh, with her, uh, her heart disease and her journey through the healthcare system. And discuss a, discuss a novel chest pain algorithm, uh, which we're very excited for, for women who present at the emergency department. Next slide, please. Cardiovascular disease continues to be the leading cause of death for Canadian women. Sex and gender differences and disparities um, with respect to CVD awareness, development, uh, identification and treatment unfortunately persist. The Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance uh, was established back in 2018 as a volunteer uh, network of experts and advocate, advocates to develop and disseminate evidence-informed strategies to transform clinical practice and enhance collaborative action on women's cardiovascular health here in Canada. Um, I'm excited to say that it has now grown to nearly 200 volunteer stakeholders, which includes clinicians, scientists, uh, trainees, persons with lived experience with cardiovascular disease, and we all work together uh, on multiple strategic initiatives focusing on our five themes, which is uh, policy, uh, knowledge translation, training and education, research knowledge gen uh, generation, and of course, with Wear Red Canada, advocacy efforts. Uh, the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance aims at improving clinical care outcomes uh, for women across Canada. Next slide, please. 
like to start things off with a poll, uh, just to see if you're still awake. <laughs> it's been a very busy day. Uh, and so if you don't mind, oh, thank you so much, Melissa, uh, for posting. So here's the polling question. Uh, and please feel free uh, to make your, your uh, responses. Uh, which of the following statements are true? A, both men and women are just as likely to present with chest discomfort as a symptom of a heart attack. B, uh, a reproductive health history is relevant when assessing cardiovascular risk in women. C, in women with a history of preeclampsia, um, the mean age at the time of the first heart attack or stroke is under the age of 40. D, where one lives is a risk factor for heart disease in women. And E, all of the above are true. So I'll give you a moment to uh, lock in your vote. All right, well, <laughs> I think there was an underlying uh, answer there uh, with all the above being true. Fantastic, uh, and you're correct. So we're gonna be talking more and more about this, uh, in, in, this in, the, in the future slides, so exciting stuff. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. I'd now like to introduce uh, an amazing woman, uh, Nicole, if you don't mind, if you could uh, share your story with us, please. Yes, hello. Like uh, Lisa said, my name is Nicole Nickerson. I live in rural Nova Scotia. My um, my story starts um, 10 years ago, basically now, um, when I lived in a place called Cross Lake, Manitoba. My sister, at the age of 25, passed away unexpectedly of a massive heart attack. <clears throat> Excuse me, a heart attack. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have a frog in my throat for some reason. So, um, after I found out that my sister passed away, I moved home because I felt that I would have um, care closer to me as I was living eight hours north of Winnipeg. And so I went for all of my testing. Everything came back great, even my stress test. Although I do admit I had a, a lot of lifestyle factors. I smoked, I had a stressful job, I just lost my sister, et cetera, et cetera. I probably didn't eat the healthiest. Um, so when my sister passed away, um, after my stress test, one month later, I, all of a sudden I ate some egg sandwiches and I really wasn't feeling well, but it was just, it felt like gas. I had been burping a lot. I had a lot of pressure in my chest. And so I just kind of put it off to the back of my mind. And then I realized that I should probably go to Emerge. I went to our regional hospital and um, before even my blood work came back, they were telling me it was impossible for me to be having a heart attack because I had just done so well on my stress test. So they handed me a prescription for GERD and sent me along my way. The problem was that I paced the floor for the next two days. It obviously was not GERD. I was, um, I was instructed by um, an, another nurse that I should probably go to another hospital and get a second opinion. I went to our smaller hospital site where they were familiar with my family history and there was also all female staff working and they knew right away something wasn't right. So I was sent to um, a bigger hospital in Halifax where I was taken into the cath lab and I indeed had had a heart event and I um, had been given a stint. At that time, I myself was working in healthcare at um, a hospital, and I was actually unable to finish cardiac rehab because of my schedule. I do feel that if I would have been able to finish cardiac rehab, it would have made a big difference. However, I ended up becoming pregnant uh, the first year after that, about a year after that, and that pregnancy went great. I was well monitored and nobody wanted me to be pregnant, but it went great. So then I became pregnant with my second child. And from the start, things were a little bit different. I had gestational diabetes. I just wasn't feeling great during this pregnancy. And as the anniversary of my sister's death came closer, I felt more and more sick, but the day came of the anniversary of my sister's death, and I honestly felt I just had a lot of anxiety. I just knew something wasn't right. I couldn't settle. I was cold. I just felt like I had a cold, and I just thought, I wish this cold would come so I would feel better. 
But then I thought something isn't right. I started pacing the floors again. So like anybody would do, I fed my daughter, I got her ready for bed. And I said to my husband, I think we need to go to emerge. There was a sudden snowstorm. So we ended up going to the other smaller emerge site. And so they, my troponin was in the gray area. The region, the big hospital didn't have room for me unless they knew for sure I was having a heart event. And the other site, um, our regional site, said that I was too complicated of care to for them to accept me. It ended up, um, I did have a heart event. And once the second troponin came back, um, elevated, they realized they thought I might be going into labor. So I ended up being life flighted to um, Halifax again, where I spent six days on the CCU. And um, obviously they felt it would be safer to have a vaginal birth, but um, my son breached. Um, the Friday before they were going to induce me. So I ended up having a C-section. I did get to go into the cath lab the following day, thanks to a female cardiologist. And I had another stint and then I got to go be with my, my son and my husband. So it turned out that he was actually 31 weeks. So it is worth mentioning that my first heart attack, I was 31 years old. And so this happened six years ago. My son is healthy now, and he just um, he just celebrated his sixth birthday. So we're very very lucky. And I should mention this time around, I did have the chance to finish cardiac rehab, and it really did change my life. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I appreciate your story. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to now introduce Dr. Shaheen Jaffer uh, to continue the uh, the presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you, Nicole, as well, for sharing your story. I really appreciate that. And um, to the audience, audience, it's an honor and a privilege to present to you today. Um, so as some of you may know, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in women globally, and it is the leading cause of premature death in women in Canada. And as you can see on the graph on the right, um, Canada is in the red line and the US is the teal colored line. Cardiovascular related mortality rates in women have increased over the last two decades in high income countries. And unfortunately, mortality continues to rise. Next slide, please. Now, the um, discussion has you know, been had, if we talk about the scope of the problem, um, the conversation about diversity, gender bias, and increased cardiovascular risk in women has been had for over 15 years now. And you can see in this Time Magazine cover from 2003, which states, you know, one out of three women will die of heart disease. Unfortunately, however, we remain immersed in a milieu of unders, uh, under syndrome is what I call it. We are under-informed, under-investigated, under-diagnosed, under-treated, you know, under-represented in clinical trials. And next slide, please. On average, um, about two-thirds of cardiovascular research is focused on men. And next slide. We are really, you know, truly misunderstood, as has been described by the Heart and Stroke Foundation Canada. As well, Indigenous, Black, and Asian ethnicity representation in clinical trials has been less than 10%, even less than 3% uh, in some studies, really begging the question as to the generalizability of this data to these populations. Next slide, please. Now the stakes are high when it comes to women's cardiovascular health. Heart attack symptoms are not recognized in over 50% of women. And women with a heart attack are more likely than men to die in the first year post-MI. More women die of heart failure than men, and more women die of stroke than men. And significant sex and gender bias exists in women with acute coronary syndrome. Women receive less evidence-based medical therapy, you know, less acute reperfusion, less percutaneous uh, intervention like stenting, and less coronary artery bypass grafting, and indeed uh, fewer referrals to cardiac rehabilitation. 
Next slide, please. Now, in terms of symptoms, both men and women present most often with chest pain. Women, however, can describe this uh, chest pain uh, more of uh, like a pressure or a heaviness or perhaps even a discomfort. Women also present uh, more often uh, than men with other associated symptoms, such as gastrointestinal symptoms, such as nausea and heartburn, which Nicole described, uh, you know, her situation, as well, you know, epigastric or upper abdominal discomfort, uh, perhaps upper back or shoulder pain, you know, profound or unusual fatigue and weakness, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, and palpitations. And often, in addition to chest pain, three or more of these associated symptoms can also be present in women. Now, we're trying, uh, you know, not to use the term atypical symptoms, which we have used a lot. We're trying to get away from it because these symptoms can actually be a typical uh, presentation for women. Next slide, please. Now, one of the objectives of this um, session is to educate healthcare providers that women can present, again, as Nicole did, with gastrointestinal symptoms and uh, as a manifestation of their cardiovascular disease. And often GI symptoms are considered as less urgent or even non-urgent. So level four or level five on the Canadian triage and acuity scale. And this may lead to life-threatening delays in assessment and treatment. Next slide, please. Now let's switch gears um, to cardiovascular risk factor assessment in women. Although traditional risk factors such as high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, as listed here in, in the green middle box, are well recognized by the medical community, what's not commonly known is that they pose a disproportionately higher morbidity and mortality burden in women. And traditional risk factors may not always be present in women experiencing chest pain. In reality, a women's cardiovascular health risks comprise a triad of intersectional factors. So female specific, traditional and under-recognized risk factors, which can exist independently or in combination. And we'll discuss these in the, over the next several slides. Next, please. So how significant is this increased cardiovascular risk uh, with regards to traditional risk factors? Well, smoking is the single most preventable cause of myocardial infarction in women, and female smokers have a threefold greater risk of MI when compared to men. Women with type 2 diabetes have doubled the risk of heart disease, as well as an earlier occurrence of stroke, heart failure, and MI when compared to non-diabetic women. Hypertension is more common, uh, is more prevalent in women over 60 and less well controlled in women compared to men. And obesity and you know, relative increases in LDL, cholesterol, and decreases in HDL in menopause heighten women's cardiovascular risk profiles over the lifespan. Psychosocial factors such as stress and mental health also contribute to increasing cardiovascular risk. And we will touch upon these aspects a little more shortly. What's really important to note, however, is that by managing these modifiable risk factors, up to 80%, yes, 80% of heart disease can be prevented. Next slide, please. Now, sex and gender specific risk factors for cardiovascular disease um, exist, as I, I mentioned, all across the lifespan in women from conception up to the climacteric. I don't have time to cover all of these milestones in a lot of detail, and I will focus today on conception though, uh, i.e. the placenta, as well as on pregnancy. Suffice it to say, however, that polycystic ovarian syndrome, autoimmune, uh, autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus, which affect women more than men, uh, as well as premature menopause, they all have higher rates of stroke, coronary heart disease, and cardiovascular mortality in women. And breast cancer treatments such as targeted therapy, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy, especially for left-sided breast cancer, can lead to heart failure. And as you well know, cardiovascular risk and mortality starts to increase dramatically uh, in women soon after menopause. Next slide, please. 
Now, some of you may have heard of the phrase that pregnancy is a woman's first stress test. But the stress test lasts not nine minutes, but nine months. And indeed, the physiological changes that occur to accommodate increased blood volume and cardiac output put a tremendous stress on the mother's cardiovascular system. Next slide, please. The CHAMPS trial included 1 million women in Ontario, and it demonstrated that maternal placental syndromes, or MPS, which are defined as preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, placental abruption, and infarction, increased the future risk of cardiovascular disease on average twofold for women. And other studies have indicated that similar increased risk is also present in women with gestational diabetes. And the mean age of having the first cardiovascular event, such as stroke or MI, in women with MPS was 38 years of age. Lastly, the more severe the maternal uh, sorry, placental syndrome, the greater the cardiovascular risk, up to fourfold, uh, particularly if there's intrauterine fetal death. Next slide, please. So what is the role of the placenta in women's cardiovascular health? The prophetic placenta, as I've termed it, is actually a very important vascular organ. Time Magazine, in an article in 2020, described how the first nine months of one's first pregnancy shaped the rest of one's life. And it's true. Not only are placenta-mediated diseases associated with high maternal morbidity, including depression and mortality, there is a higher incidence of preterm birth, small for gestational age newborns, and increased congenital heart disease in the neonate. And in children of mothers with preeclampsia, hypertension and elevated body mass index can occur as early as four to 10 years of age, as well as long-term cardiometabolic sequelae such as stroke, coronary artery disease, and diabetes later in life. Next slide, please. We now come to the third pillar in the assessment of a woman's cardiovascular risk, which is under-recognized risk factors, some of which uh, are also described as forces above the skin. And evidence indicates that these risk factors may exist independently or in combination. And mental health and depression, in particular, increases a woman's risk of adverse cardiac events by 50 to 70%. Yet only 3% of cardiologists screen for depression. Psychosocial disadvantages, some of which I've listed here, for example, loneliness, unemployment, lack of social support, disability, are more common in women. And your postal code, where you live, particularly if in a rural region, is a significant risk factor. In addition, domestic abuse and intimate partner violence are significant risk factors for women. Lastly, and let's not be colorblind, one's race or ethnicity and being of indigenous heritage also increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, more so in women. Next slide, please. Now, just a little bit of uh, pathophysiology here. Um, causes of coronary artery disease can be different for men and women. However, the most common cause in both sexes is obstructive coronary artery disease, i.e. thrombus formation, which you can see in the picture on the left. This is, again, the most common cause of acute coronary syndrome in both men and women. Women, however, are more likely to have inoka or minoka, i.e. ischemia or MI with non-obstructive coronary artery disease, which is defined as less than 50% stenosis in a coronary artery on angiography. And as you can see on the right, Minoka is actually an umbrella term, which includes causes such as epicardial coronary artery spasm, coronary microvascular disease, plaque rupture, plaque erosion, and spontaneous coronary artery dissection, otherwise known as SCAD. Next slide. please. When we think about the coronary arteries, we routinely focus on the epicardial arteries, the arteries on the surface of the heart. But particularly when it comes to women's cardiovascular health, we should also be considering the entire coronary circulation, which includes the pre-arterials, the arterioles, and even smaller. Next slide. Because 
what we see on our angiogram are these large arteries, the epicardial circulation. Next slide. But what we don't see is 95% of the myocardial blood supply, which is the microvasculature. So we need to sweat the small stuff, as eloquently described by Katrineric in his paper, when we consider women's heart health. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are our take home messages? Well, of course, life, we don't want to miss it. So remember that cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of premature death in women in Canada, and that knowledge and treatment gaps persist. A reproductive health history is essential when assessing cardiovascular risk in women. Women have unique risk factors, distinct pathophysiology, and sometimes different symptoms for heart disease, which may require up triaging their acuity level when they arrive at the emergency department. And don't forget that traditional risk factors pose a worse prognosis in women. And now next, uh, we are pleased to share a novel algorithm that covers all these points. And it is my pleasure now to hand over to Dr. Randawa to discuss this further. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shaheen. It's a pleasure uh, and an honor to be here and to share this important message. I want to introduce the development of a chest pain protocol for women presenting to the emergency department and why we arose um, at defining this. We know that there are significant knowledge and care gaps that persist in women's heart health and cardiovascular disease related morbidity and mortality rates remain quite high in women. There's also a paucity of sex and gender specific cardiovascular disease protocols, not only in Canada, but also very much abroad. And this manuscript describes the development of an algorithmic protocol for women who present acutely to the emergency department with chest pain. Specifically, the protocol addresses the intersectionality of traditional female-specific and under-recognized cardiovascular disease risk factors in the differential diagnosis of ACS through a sex and gender-based lens. The chest pain protocol is unique, comprehensive, and easy to follow. This quality improvement initiative is generalizable not only to the acute, but also to the urgent care settings. Next slide. Here is a picture of the chest pain protocol. This is a really busy slide, so let's break it down into parts. Next slide. The first step is that we explore the symptoms that women present to the emergency department with and evaluate the intersectional cardiovascular risk factors, specifically the female-specific, traditional, and under-recognized cardiovascular disease risk factors. You'll notice that the female-specific risk factors focus on aspects of pregnancy, reproductive health, and malignancy with its therapeutics, as highlighted by Dr. Jaffer. The traditional cardiovascular risk factors are ones that we already know, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, smoking, obesity, coronary artery disease, and a family history. And finally, the under-recognized cardiovascular disease risk factors, which includes our social determinants of health, mental health conditions, race and ethnicity, and our autoimmune dis disorders. Next slide. So step two asks that in patients where we have a high level of suspicion for an acute coronary syndrome, we actually undertake cardiac evaluation. That includes an ECG and cardiac biomarkers within 10 minutes of arrival to the emergency department in order to assess for an acute coronary syndrome. And if our ECG findings show ST and T wave changes, as well as an elevated troponin level, we should follow the acute coronary syndrome pathway with coronary revascularization where indicated. If the findings suggest unstable angina, then we should treat the patients as per our guidelines, including 
subsequent evaluation with appropriate stress testing and guideline-directed medical therapies. Importantly, we also need to rule out many other mimickers of ACS that are catastrophic, as shown on the right, and that include cardiopulmonary causes and non-cardiac causes. You can see under cardiopulmonary causes, some catastrophic conditions include an acute aortic dissection, pericarditis or myocarditis, pulmonary embolism, decompensated heart failure, valvular heart disease resulting in shock, and hypertensive emergencies. And in the non-cardiac causes, this includes septic shock, anemia or bleeding, and toxins, which can be mimickers and cause demand ischemia in patients who present to the emergency department, which can include chest discomfort. Next slide. So I hope I've been able to show you that this novel chest pain protocol for women who present to the emergency department may actually help us work towards an earlier recognition of cardiovascular disease risk factors and mimickers of chest pain that will allow us overall to improve health prevention and manage some of the intersectional cardiovascular disease risk factors that we don't often think about on top of the traditional risk factors. It may also allow us to diagnose acute coronary syndrome faster along with ruling out its mimickers, facilitate earlier therapeutic interventions for any of these conditions, facilitate faster access to appropriate coronary revascularization, and subsequent to that, referral to cardiac rehabilitation in patients who do have evidence of acute coronary syndrome or unstable angina. Next slide. So I hope that we've been able to show a novel chest pain algorithm with which our primary goals are to reduce the sex and gender gaps for cardiovascular care, importantly to facilitate enhancement of earlier recognition, diagnosis, management, and disease prevention of heart health with a sex and gender lens. Our next immediate steps are to pilot this novel chest pain algorithm for women in several emergency department and primary care urgent centers to lobby for the sex and gender predominant symptoms and cardiovascular risk factors to be included in informing our C-test scoring that Dr. Jaffa alluded to earlier, and finally to educate the public about women's specific chest pain symptoms and risk factors through awareness campaigns and targeted promotion, such as the Wear Red Canada campaign today. Next slide. We would like to thank uh, the members of the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance knowledge translation and mobilization working groups with a special thanks to all of these individuals who are listed here. And with that, I'd like to hand over uh, the podium uh, to uh, Lisa Comer uh, to end uh, the presentation. Thank you so much. Amazing. Well, thank you so very much, Dr. Randa. This is um, a, a huge accomplishment. And I just want to say thank you to our presenters today. Um, and, and also to all the members, uh, just to echo uh, what was mentioned about all the members that have contributed to this wealth of information um, and the algorithm publication, as well as our uh, three-page uh, clinical document, clinical summary that's currently on our website. Um, and uh, so I just want to thank the three of you uh, for your time today and your expertise in this area. Uh, it's, it's, it's greatly appreciated. Um, and also, I wanted to highlight, next slide, please, if you don't mind, Kelsey. Um, some really exciting news, as uh, Dr. Renhana mentioned, sorry, that, um, you know, with regards to this uh, national survey that's going to be coming soon, um, 
you know, after the publication has been done, uh, now we're like, where do we go from here? And so what we're planning on doing is uh, the team is now designing this national survey, which is targeting the pre-hospital providers. Uh, so that's the emergency medical services, the paramedics, uh, the emergency department, medical staff, um, and, uh, and everybody in order to assess the baseline knowledge of primary stakeholders, uh, introduce the, the protocol um, as well, and gather opinions uh, from, from these individuals and understand what their motivation would be, their willingness, and potentially the feasibility on whether there's actual opportunity for uptake of this algorithm in a variety of different uh, emergency department settings. Uh, we are going to be looking at uh, reaching out to the, the rural uh, communities, community hospitals, teaching hospitals, uh, and more of the urban settings across Canada uh, to gather information on how we can really disseminate uh, and, uh, and test uh, this protocol. Uh, and so it's a very exciting time uh, from the, within the Canadian Women's Health Alliance, uh, within the team here as well, uh, and all your expertise and time. And so just to let you know, when I say coming soon, that's in the next few short weeks. Uh, and so the results of this anonymous service are really going to help uh, with the decisions, uh, and specifically with the triage and women in the chest pain. So if you are interested in receiving this survey, uh, please reach out to us, the CWHHC at ottawaheart.ca. Um, and so just in case you're not missed, uh, but our plan is to disseminate far and wide uh, this survey to gather all this information to really help us uh, moving forward with this very, very important initiative. Um, and so I'm going to take this time now uh, with questions. Uh, let's let's start with the discussion. Do you mind uh, next slide there? Actually, we could just not share screen and maybe if uh, all of our members here on the call, uh, all of our uh, presenters wouldn't mind uh, sharing your video. Uh, and for those on the on the uh, the viewers or participants, um, if uh, if you have a question, please feel free to uh, type it into the Q&A section at any time. Um, and also, just as a friendly reminder, uh, due to the nature of this public platform, we ask that you keep your questions general in nature. Um, if you have a more personal question, uh, we recommend that you contact your healthcare provider. Uh, and so let's just have a look and see about uh, any potential questions that have come through the chat. Okay, I have one here. Um, is there a risk engine to include all the risk factors for heart disease in women? Uh, Dr. Jaffer, Dr. Ranhawa, which uh, either one would you like to, to take that question? I'll start off and then Dr. Randava can perhaps add to that. So um, I think, unfortunately, there isn't, <laughs> but there are many organizations that are working to change that. Um, what I would suggest, though, a couple of things. Um, there is the Q risk score, so capital Q, capital R, capital I, capital S, capital K, and then, then the number three, um, which is more comprehensive than some of the other risk uh, engines we use, like Framingham's or perhaps even Reynolds, because it includes, uh, number one, ethnicity. It includes some of these autoimmune conditions that we've talked about, which are more cardiovascular risk factors in women. It, it also asks about mental health. So I think that's a much better risk engine to use in for women's cardiovascular health. But what I'd like to add as well is, you know, the sort of a question about guidelines as well. And the, in the Canadian Dyslipidemia Guidelines in 2021, you know, for the first time included um, uh, like a, a few paragraphs on adverse pregnancy outcomes. And Adverse pregnancy outcomes like preeclampsia, preterm birth, et cetera, that I talked a little bit about are now considered as risk enhancers. So what that means is that when um, physicians and nurses and caregivers talk to uh, women who have these, have had these risks, um, really we'd like to um, increase recommendations for all of the lifestyle changes that need to happen to prevent future heart disease. Remember we said up to 80% of heart disease can be uh, you know, prevent it. So healthy lifestyle behaviors like nutrition, exercise, avoidance of tobacco, stress management, keeping a healthy weight, all of these things, there needs to be a lot more focus on counseling in these areas to prevent uh, heart disease in women. Uh, Dr. Randall? 
Thank you very much. Uh, um, you know, I do, I do agree with uh, Dr. Jaffer that um, many of the female-specific cardiovascular disease risk factors are not currently included in a lot of the risk scores or in the even in the evaluation. And I think with increasing advocacy and awareness uh, and expanding research we are gaining an appreciation of these risk factors and their long-term effects on cardiovascular health, particularly in women. And I'm hopeful um, that uh, in the future, as we gather more data and we see the prognostic uh, findings from some of this research, we'll be able to build towards including some of these risk factors within um, within cardiovascular health scores with, res with regards to cardiovascular disease. Increasingly also, there's an appreciation that certain cardiovascular disease affects different populations um, in different ways. And I think um, as we understand that better, hopefully we'll be able to include some of that work also in our evaluation. But even just getting physicians in the emergency department to uh, recognize that we need to think about women who present with chest pain a little bit differently than some of our other individuals who present, I think that awareness may also hopefully improve the early recognition and evaluation of women in, uh, in the emergency department. Uh, so I think this work is evolving and um, it's really growing. Uh, and I look forward to the positive impact of this early recognition. Thank you both. Uh, so I just see the question in the chat from Julie. Uh, have you started the pilot study yet? And if so, where? <laughs> Would anyone like to comment? Maybe Julie wants to go first. <laughs> <laughs> I think that'd be amazing. Depending on Julie, where you're located, we'd love to have you. Um, I think for us, the first step is the national survey uh, to gather some great information, uh, you know, some feedback, and then uh, adapt accordingly. Uh, and then I think there's a great opportunity for a multi-site uh, uh, study. Uh, question, uh, any, uh, anything else to add? Oh, we're good. Perfect. Yeah, very exciting time for us. I think uh, this is the the first step, of course, with uh, this amazing publication that just came out. So we'll put a link into the chat as well for for those who are interested. Um, okay, I have one more question. Uh, why is the placenta a predictor of future heart disease in women? Dr. Jaffer, would you like to take that one? To sure. Start? Okay. Well, thanks so much for that question. So. In terms of the, I guess, the pathophysiology of these adverse pregnancy outcomes like hypertension and gestational diabetes, what occurs um, initially, if I can go back to sort of the fetus, uh, there are cells called uh, cytotrophoblasts that invade the um, uh, spiral arteries on the side of the mom, right? So these arteries, uh, unfortunately, don't remodel properly. And so the placenta doesn't develop properly and there's narrowing of the uterine artery. So basically there's reduced perfusion between the uterus and, and the uh, placenta. So this placental dysfunction uh, also causes the release of some glycoproteins. They're called anti-angiogenic glycoproteins. And these are inflammatory mediators and these go into the maternal circulation. And then this causes a very sort of pro-inflammatory uh, environment and endothelial dysfunction. And there's a lot of small vessel microvascular damage uh, to the arteries. And then unfortunately, over the long term, there's a lot of um, sort of cellular biology data that shows that vascular aging in these women is increased. And that leads to the premature heart disease, uh, you know, 10 years down the road. So women between 30 and 45 will get their heart disease earlier because of all of these changes. I hope that helps. Thank you. Anything else to add to that, uh, to that answer? 
Okay, and I'd like to uh, to ask Nicole. Um, I know with, with sharing your story, uh, your impactful story, uh, with your sister and the travels and everything that was going on uh, during in your lifetime around then. Any advice, like for any of the? Obviously, you're an amazing advocate. You've been advocating, um, and, and, and you know, for many years for women's cardiovascular health. Um, for this particular presentation going to the emergency department, potentially in a rural area uh, where you live. Any any advice to those who, um, or for persons with lived experience or just the general group of women in general that you could, uh, you could partake on us tonight? I'll admit this isn't just come from myself. <clears throat> I know a lot of women that have had the same position as I have, you know, all across the world, basically. And if there's one thing I've heard consistently over and over, even though they couldn't necessarily describe what was wrong, they knew something was wrong. And I think as females, we're always in tune to our body. And so even when I think back on both times when like um, we, we spoke about how they weren't typical for males, they're typical for females, but not typical for males. And I think both times I knew deep down something wasn't right. So I think you really need to find that courage and advocate for yourself get that second opinion. And, you know, um, my cardiologist, Dr. Sharon Mulvey always tells me, she said, if you can't say anything else, say chest pain, because that's one thing that every doctor understands. Thank you. Uh, any other comments uh, from the group uh, before we, to we move on to the, to the wrap up? I just like to thank uh, Nicole for so, you know, eloquently and, and mm -hmm. sharing her story because Nicole had a lot of risk factors. When you look back at our presentation today, she had a lot of risk factors, and you know, I thank everybody also for attending because we do have um, a lot of work to do in sharing this information. And so, you know, we really appreciate everybody's uh, support in this, and hopefully, we can all work together to advance women's cardiovascular health together. Great message. Thank you, Sheen. Um, okay, so uh, Kelsey, do you mind just putting up a sharing screen for the, the evaluation? Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to move this over. Perfect. So everybody, um, I just want to obviously echo thank you uh, to our amazing presenters today uh, for, for sharing your, your expertise and your, your experiences um, and excitement. I think there's a lot for us to be excited about for this upcoming uh, opportunity uh, for this uh, to test this, uh, this algorithm. Um, and so uh, for those, as I'm just going to mention again, if you are interested in the chat, our email address is there. If you would like to participate, just to make sure that we've, in, we, we've included you in the dissemination uh, listserv, um, we will be going forward with that national survey, as I mentioned, uh, later on next month. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, also, you can see the QR code in front of you. Your feedback matters to us. It allows us to get better and better and better with our webinars. Um, and of course, any if you want more information on our resources that we offer within the Canadian Men's Heart Health Alliance, um, please feel free to visit our website. Um, and also, I just wanted to mention again that this session is being recorded and will be available in the next number of days on our website. Uh, and so please feel free, share far and wide. We want this information to get out to as many hospitals across Canada um, and uh, in healthcare centers. So again, Again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your time um, to our presenters and to those that are listening today. Um, happy Wearwood Canada Day. And uh, we look forward to connecting uh, in future opportunities. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye.